Good afternoon. Welcome to the second Ask Industry webinar uh, on image exchange, viewing, and archiving in the cloud. Uh, I am Judy Gichoya, the, an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine, and I'm thrilled to serve as a moderator for today's webinar. We are privileged to have with us three uh, industry experts, so thank you. Uh, Achi Mayani, from, who's the Vice President of Product Management at, uh, for Cloud Solutions at Change Healthcare. Uh, Maurice Pana, the CEO of Umbra Health. And Bobby Rowe, Director Sol Solutions Architecture and Cloud Computing at Visage Imaging. Uh, C members are eligible to receive one hour of IIP CE towards the ABI CIP certification or recertification for this live webinar. To receive the credit, simply complete the post-webinar survey, which will pop up after the mm -hmm. webinar has ended. A certificate will be issued and available within two to three weeks in the grid section of your CMU account. Not a member and one CE, please become a C member today. And so after the panel discussion, we will be engaging in a Q&A session. So be sure to ask your questions through the Q&A icon found at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. I'll be watching that. And so uh, without further ado, let's begin this uh, webinar. And so uh, I get the pleasure of asking Achi my first question as, uh, so please, please send in the questions uh, so that I can um, ask them on your behalf. So Achi, what's your perspective on cloud technology being able to unlock the power of data to inform better decision support and ultimately improve patient outcomes? And what have been the, the key learnings uh, on this? Thank you, Judy, for that question. Um, you know, as I think we all of us can, can appreciate and, and almost all worry about this, that, you know, the, the healthcare data is really exploding at, exploding at this point, um, you know, about 2000 exabytes of data in 2020 and then still continues to grow. And with all of the advances in medical imaging and modalities, you know, the, the tomosynthesis is one of the best examples I could think of, but really, you know, the, the resolution and the quality and all of the aspects that are, that are sort of contributing to, to data is also growing. Leave alone medical imaging, you know, if you even think about, you know, the data architecture and healthcare, uh, they're, they're, it's very, very complex. It's coming from so many different devices, from payers, patients now, we are talking about internet of things. So, you know, it's, it's going to continue to explode. So, you know, when we at Change Healthcare started the journey, you know, we started out, you know, with a simple premise of, you know, reducing complexity and improving patient care. But I think we've, along the way, I think we've learned some really key lessons, you know, and how powerful, you know, the cloud technology can be. And, and especially, I think when we talk about, you know, cloud native, development and cloud native ecosystem and platform. One of the things that, you know, uh, just last week, right? You know, we talk about migration of this, these chunks of data. And this data that, you know, we, we were working with one of the, the large hospitals and we're just looking at one site, you know, bringing them over to our cloud native enterprise imaging platform. And it, we're talking about 11, million studies in a matter of, you know, days. And so, you know, that is really the power of cloud. When you start talking about, you know, you're migrating only once, or when you talk about, you know, zero downtime upgrades, or, you know, no planned, unplanned upgrades, you know, we're talking about four nines of reliability. Even the simple math, you know, that goes to show, you know, that's less than an hour in an entire year that your system is going to be down. So then, you know, cost starts coming in. You know, and like I said, you know, we when we started out, you know, we were really focused on delivering, you know, sort of loosening the complexity, simplifying the care so that our radiologists, our clinicians can focus on what they do best. But then, you know, when you talk about adding the math, you know, that's right money right there, right? You know, you're talking about just an hour lost. That's, you know, you're talking about, you know, downtimes, you know, not having them anymore. And even as in terms of, you know, sort of centralizing all of this data in the cloud, democratizing all of this data in the cloud, I think that's where, you know, sort of the key pivotal moments came in our journey with our customers. I think the other big sort of uh, important learning was cybersecurity. You know, for the past, I want to say, you know, five years, you know, we've been talking about cloud for such a long time, but 
you know, it, it has always been a mission critical system. And, you know, will my networking be enough, you know, to actually move to the cloud? What about PHI? What about security? And in the past, you know, I want to say six months and in some of the worst times in history, we've seen so many cybersecurity attacks on our organizations, on our providers. And, you know, talking about all of this patient information and, you know, the recovery of it, you know, I was reading an FBI report a couple of weeks ago, you know, it, it's somewhere between two to three million dollars when you talk about recovery after such a after such an attack. So, you know, with all of that sort of need and urgency around cybersecurity, most of the vendors, and obviously we are proud that Change Healthcare is one of the only vendors to, to be cloud native and, you know, have the SOC 2 certification, high trust certification, and also the ISO certification. So the, the, the organizations are also sort of, you know, realizing and taking note that, you know, this abstraction of services is one, but, you know, even if they had the talent and, uh, you know, all of the talent and all of the capacity that it takes to actually keep the data secure, you know, the standards for on-prem are just not there. Versus, you know, we can actually adhere to these gold standards that other, you know, SaaS companies and cloud comp uh, platforms have, you know, sort of uh, established already, you know, whether it's Salesforce, whether it's, you know, Facebook or any other uh, financial platform for that matter. So I think it really the learnings have been that, you know, as you democratize the data, you know, you can pull the levers of cost, complexity and care, and also, you know, really provide this 360 view of patient history, which was not possible in ways before. Um, obviously we will talk about, you know, how this democratization actually enables some of the newer technologies as well, you know, whether it's AI and MLP, but I think that's where sort of the key momentum is that, you know, once we've liberated the data and the data starts working for us, you know, that is when, you know, we can truly improve the, the, the lives of our clinicians and of, of our radiologists and, and sort of put joy back in the practice, if you will. Oh, you just touched on the Marie Kondo here, put joy <laughs> back into the practice. You know, cybersecurity <laughs> costs, managing downtime, democratizing the data, adhering to certification and standards, and just a 360 patient view. Bobby, is cloud all these fancy things? Is it more, is in cloud more expensive than on-prem? And how can we possibly ever afford a switch, this switch to enjoy the, the benefits? Sure, so um, thanks for the question, uh, Judy. It's, it's one of those things that most people assume in, in most cases accurately that an equivalent resource in a cloud is generally more expensive than that same resource. If you just look at the, the physical device itself, the server, for example, uh, if you deploy it on premise or, or what we generally refer to as private cloud, meaning deployed in the customer's infrastructure, uh, usually deployed in the customer's data center rather than on premise. Um, so um, the, the real key to making cloud affordable, and in fact, in many cases, even less expensive than on premise deployments is the elasticity and, and the use of what is often referred to as microservices or Kubernetes. Um, and, and that's something that uh, we're certainly proud along with others uh, to be able to say that the Visage application uh, has always been based on microservices. So uh, for us to be able to natively deploy on cloud infrastructure, uh, in other words, not on servers that we're placing co-located in a, a cloud data center, uh, but on the native cloud infrastructure in, in all of the major cloud providers, uh, allows us to elastically expand and then perhaps even more importantly, contract those resources when they're no longer needed. Uh, a good example of that is uh, as, the, as the number of users ramps up in the morning, we can expand the resources to support that. And then as it ramps back down, we contract those away so that it saves the cost uh, and, and do that proactively and automatically uh, so that it uh, always provides the necessary resources uh, you never have to worry about uh, out of memory or out of licenses or any of those kinds of things that are, are so classically a concern, uh, but yet end up with the benefits. The other component of that is, of course, when you deploy in a cloud infrastructure, you've eliminated all of those often unaccounted for uh, or hidden uh, costs with an on-premise or, or private cloud deployment. Uh, the cost of the data center uh, physical environment, the space, 
the network infrastructure, the power, the cooling, the human resources to support all of that. Uh, all of that is, is often extremely expensive. Uh, and then certainly touching on what Archie had said with regard to security, uh, there's, there's simply no way realistically that a hospital enterprise can compete on the security and, um, and availability of a system when it's deployed in a cloud environment. Uh, we're actually working with cloud provisioning uh, for storage that guarantees 11 nines of availability, which is something on the order of a 10,000th of a second per year of even statistically possible downtime. Uh, and of course, there's, there's never been any downtime with any of the Visage customers uh, with regard to any kind of an update. We've always deployed in a way that provides redundancy to eliminate that concern. Um, but uh, net result is uh, cloud absolutely is cost effective, uh, more so in most cases, if not all, than doing an on-premise deployment. And perhaps one of the, the golden nuggets or the silver lining of the cloud is that it actually in all cases is at least as fast from a clinical usage perspective, if not faster um, than an on-premise deployment. So that's one of the little surprises that most people don't anticipate. So I just want to unpack just a little bit to your question. So is it an all or none phenomenon? Actually, there is a quote here on the chat that says, friends don't let friends build data centers. So is it all <laughs> or none? Am I going to move to the cloud or am I going to stay on-prem with my private cloud? Or is there a, a, a moment where we can see a transition? And I'm, go I'm going to just have you respond and give Achi and Maurice just a few minutes to respond before we move on to the next question. Okay, so sure. So um, as our director of solutions architecture, one of the things that I'm doing almost every day is talking with our existing customers about um, the appropriate hardware specifications for a hardware refresh. Uh, and uh, up until about uh, maybe a year or so ago, uh, those were always talking about, you know, how many CPU cores, how much memory, all of that you know, hardware type of information. And about a year or so ago, that transitioned and it has almost universally now become a conversation about how do we, um, instead of refreshing our hardware, how do we move to the cloud? And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that almost all of our customers have made the decision to start that transition process. Uh, there, uh, there are certainly uh, many of our new customers that aren't even talking about doing an on-premise, exclusively talking about doing cloud deployments. Now, something that I, I think we'll probably touch on a little bit later even more is it is certainly possible to do somewhat of a hybrid deployment where you put some of your resources in the cloud and leave some of your resources in your data center or at your facility. Uh, really, the only reason to do that nowadays is if you don't trust your connection to the cloud. Um, and with so many applications, I'll use certainly the packs that we're all talking about today, uh, but also things like uh, PowerScribe One from Nuance. Uh, and, and Epic is frequently being cloud deployed now as well. But with so many of those resources transitioning to cloud-based uh, availability, um, the need for the redundancy of the network is increasing on a daily basis. And, and I would say that that's probably the more effective path for uh, certainly most of, of you that are watching today uh, to look at rather than emphasizing uh, the availability or the support of your on-premise or your data center uh, provisioning. Uh, instead, put those, put those eggs in the basket of better redundancy for the cloud infrastructure. Oftentimes, that's a very short range connection, uh, a few miles to the, to the closest point of presence. It isn't like you have to back all the data all the way to the cloud data center. And Judy, what I would say that, you know, I think Bobby's right on point, you know, as, as he talked about hybrid infrastructure, I, you know, one of the things that, you know, talk about learnings and we've learned so much, right, in the in the last 11 months, where I think, you know, the, the question about, you know, cloud adoption has changed to sort of cloud acceleration. And I think, you know, our customers, you know, which have primarily, you know, one of the biggest segments that we have are, you know, large hospitals and IDNs and government 
government and even, you know, someone as conservative that, that as they have been before, you know, even the government customers are asking us, you know, what can you do for me now between 18 and 24 months? And I think that has also helped us pivot to think about, you know, there is no sort of, you know, flipping off a switch, right? You know, our customers have made several investments on-prem investments in the last few years. And, you know, we have to be able to, you know, have a sort of a, a, a adaptability and a flexibility to match their pace of, you know, cloud adoption. And again, I think as we talk and sort of, you know, understand the difference between a cloud native platform where the entire um, ecosystem, if you will, is built into the cloud. So, you know, you're getting you're getting the experience of how you get experiences with, with say, Facebook. You know, you come on Monday morning and you've got a different timeline view without, you know, you even, uh, without you even you noticing, right? And I think that's one of the pieces that we absolutely want to allow, especially as we talk about streaming to our customers. So what we've done in the last six months is really, um, you know, built up our hybrid infrastructure where we allow our customers to retain some of the on-prem elements, you know, as as they, as they you know, sort of um, organizationally put a plan together while actually enabling some of these, you know, cloud-based, you know, ecosystem and services and microservices that, you know, Bobby mentioned, which really allows them to sort of, you know, have the same benefits of the cloud with some, you know, sort of on-prem redundancy, uh, you know, for some of the systems that are still going to be on-prem and then they can start sort of you know uh, replacing those you know components of the system you know as you know they plan out their cloud journey but i think that's been sort of a key critical pivot for most of us you know on the on the on the panel as vendors uh, and and uh, you know pax companies where we really want to you know adapt and be flexible with our customers versus you know having this sort of e even lift and shift models i feel like um, they don't really, you know, uh, they, they can't really be, you know, sort of, you know, one one switch flips it all. It really has to be sort of a, a transitionary journey for, you know, the organization that that they have to set it up. And, you know, we just have to make sure that we can enable it. Okay. Oh. Morris? Yeah. I, you know what? I agree with everything that uh, Bobby and Archie were saying. And maybe I could just step back for a second and define some of the landscape that I think we're facing um, together. One of the things that I think is so fascinating about taking cloud into healthcare is we're kind of catching up a little bit. Uh, if you see big financial, I always use the financial sector as the sort of paradigmatic who's ahead in tech. They invest unbelievable amounts in tech and so I sort of think they're onto something. So how do we kind of catch up in the, in the right way? And what's different about healthcare at the end of the day is the commitment to patient care. There's this kind of complex entrepreneurial conundrum. So when you're trying to start a company, what they tell you, if you ask Peter Thiel, he says, move fast and break things. And if I walk into a hospital and I say, we're gonna move really fast and break things and maybe you know worse, the, the look is that's not where we want to be. So we've had to learn how to balance innovation with the kind of oath everybody takes that says, first, I'll do no harm. My first priority is, you know, I, as a patient, don't want my physician telling me, hey, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but let's give it a shot. Are you okay with that? I'm like, not that okay with that. And so cloud right now is facing the conundrum of how do you while the airplane is flying or the car is driving, how do you change all those components out without having a problem? There's no kind of, uh, you know, we're just going to not do some things for today. In the age of COVID, that just doesn't exist. But there's some powerful tailwinds at our back right now, which is COVID, I think, brought to light how virtual and how hardened our infrastructure had to be. So there's a real opportunity to start that conversation. And I think if you start that conversation from a patient care and a continuity of care point of view, it, it resonates with people who are ultimately in this for that reason. And then the second piece I think is a little confusing to people is the difference between storage and compute. And it's confusing to me, so I, uh, I struggle with it all the time. Storing images is one thing, operationalizing them is another. 
And it's possible to think about a lot of different architectures for storing things in the cloud. And then how are you going to use them in the cloud has a lot to do with what kind of computing resources you can throw at a problem. And so one of the things I think is very important and very exciting, I think there's never been a better time to be in, you know, in informatics, particularly in imaging, because you should be at the top table in health systems talking about how we want to think about our storage and compute strategy. Because some things are relatively uh, low uh, consumers of compute. So I can deliver flat file data about lab results with a very small amount of compute. I can do that like an expense report. But if I'm going to kind of stream a Tomo, I'm going to be like showing HD movies in, you know, hyperspace. And it, it's very, very difficult. So I think in general, we want to make sure we're really focused on how this relates to patient care. I think that's our top, we got to put it in those terms, which is a, a unique challenge of healthcare innovation. And then I think as we unpack the various steps of what cloud means, we can have more intelligent conversations with our institutions about how we're going to fit in. And if we understand hybrid as a transitional layer to solve a compute problem, it's not a storage problem, it's a compute problem. How do you get enough throughput so the experience can be the same as it would be through the cloud for whatever reasons, whether it's a bandwidth constraint or whether it's a compute constraint. And that starts to raise a level of sophistication that I think institutions will appreciate and radiology informatics is uniquely capable of providing. And so I think this journey that we're on together is gonna to make patient care better, and it's gonna elevate radiology in a way that has never been more fun uh, because it's gonna drive a data type that is really gonna be important. So that's kind of, you know, when we step back, that's how we think about it a little bit and try to, try to take all this stuff and turn it on its ear a little bit because it's not the traditional way of thinking about cloud or innovation. And that's what's exciting about it. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, for that comment. Actually, quite a, if you're joining us later, please uh, ask questions in the q and I have quite a long list of questions that I have to ask, but really I want to take the opportunity to have conversations uh, with the people, you know, uh, who are listening in. And so, uh, you know, first of all, you've gotten a shout out from Stephen, complex entrepreneurial conundrum is very insightful. Those are big words there, so I'm not going to even try to unpack them, Maurice. But, um, you know, we are throwing a few things, microservices, you know, Kubernetes. And I'll tell you, when I went to Linux Con, the first time was very, very overwhelmed with these terms. And there are all these terminologies. We have cloud native uh, apps on prem. So can anyone uh, mention what they consider to be the basic elements of the, of the cloud? You know, let's maybe define the space. I think Maurice tried to do a little bit. I'll give you uh, maybe a few uh, seconds because we have quite a lot of questions that we have to get through. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to start that. And I'm sure Archie yes, and Morris can have stuff to add to that. So uh, certainly in the cloud environment, you have uh, some sort of a cloud storage environment. You have to have a place to keep the data. Uh, and you have compute resources, uh, essentially defined uh, virtual machines in most cases, although it is possible to, to deploy to physical machines. Uh, and then you have uh, GPU resources or, or uh, video um, calculation resources. Uh, then of course, you've got the networking and the physical and logical infrastructure that surrounds all of that uh, to allow high availability, uh, the ability to do real-time failovers to different devices, uh, in all three of those categories, storage, compute, and, and graphics, um, as well as the network connection between the cloud infrastructure and your local area network uh, at the facility or your data center uh, infrastructure. Uh, those are typically referred to as either a partner connect, uh, partner interconnect, uh, an express route, or a direct connect, depending on which one of the three public cloud providers you're talking with. Uh, and, and all of those are essentially the same thing. They're a connection between, they're, let me backtrack, they're a private connection between your network locally and the cloud infrastructure. Um, and all of that together works the same way that it does when servers are deployed in your data centers or on the floor next to you in your office. Uh, for that matter, you're connecting across the network to a resource 
that provides the functionality that you're using. Um, and, and I think that's about as basic as we can get. Um, the thing that we talk about when, we're, when we mention microservices uh, and Kubernetes is just a, a, a highly specialized form of microservices. Um, but microservices, to understand that, think back to maybe um, what guys, maybe 20 years ago when we had monolithic applications where um, a, a single application, just call it PAX. Uh, PAX had what's called a main event loop. So every, um, you know, Every time it cycled around that main event loop, it would call one of its internal sections of logic uh, or software code that would do something, uh, check and see if there was a DICOM association requested or uh, deliver images out to a user or whatever else it might happen to be. Um, and the problem with that is that if any one of those got stuck or failed, then that whole loop gets stuck. So about 20 years ago, or maybe even a little bit longer than that, computer science reached the point where it became practical to break each one of those logical functions out into their own application. Uh, the fact that they're called a service means nothing more than they run all the time, even if a user isn't doing something with them. Um, so now that main event loop is really just calling a service back and forth, and all of those services have the ability to talk with each other as well. That means that if any one of those fails, everything else keeps working. Uh, and it gives you the ability from a technical level to take the service that's had a problem and restart it. Um, just flip the switch off and back on, if you will. Um, so that's perhaps a really simplistic way of describing microservices, but hopefully if it's something that wasn't already familiar to you, that at least gets you an introduction. And uh, I would definitely suggest doing some Googling. There's some great uh, articles that go into much more depth. Okay, thank you. I mean, that was a fantastic response. And so, um, you know, along the same lines, uh, I'm coming to Archie here. Where do you see AI being applied most in enterprise imaging? And what have been the core lessons learned in this area so far from your customers, right? We're, we're moving beyond just radiology images, right? So I'm, uh, I'm curious to hear your answer. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question because I think it's probably on, on all of our minds, especially after RSNA where everything was AI, right? Everything we saw and smelled AI. Um, so I think, you know, the way we think about this issue uh, is not really about technology. I think so we have this goal that we call 2020 goal where we want to, you know, improve the radiologist productivity by 20% while reducing their burnout by 20%. And I know it sounds catchy, but I think it, this, it's really a, sort of a very emotional goal for us. And the way we categorize this is, you know, to fulfill that goal, obviously, you know, with, the, with you know, having this cloud enablement, you know, a lot becomes possible with, you know, leveraging newer technologies. And AI just happens to be one of those. And you know, even within artificial intelligence, you know, there are so many different buckets of, you know, um, sort of actual categories that you can truly, you know, leverage. And the best way to think about it is, you know, I, I say small AI and big AI. And I, when, I, when I think about small AI, it really is about, you know, intention, insight, and cognition. And I think that's where, you know, when we talk about that 2020 goal, that is truly what is valuable because, you know, we're not yet at a place where, you know, um, we're ready to roll out radio genomics, right? Where it's, you know, it's a really good application of, you know, imaging, precision medicine. Um, and, and we are going to get there, but I think what would really be helpful today for our radiologists is to make our workflow seamless for them. Uh, you know, talking about insight and, and cognition, you know, one of the things that I constantly hear about, and I'm sure, you know, um, Morris is going to join me uh, and, and Bobby as well, is, you know, hanging protocols. Uh, if you have a viewer and, you know, your radiologists are using it, they want better hanging protocols. And, and the thing that you'll hear is, you know, my, my resident of two weeks knows exactly how I want my studies to be hanged. Why can't your dump system that I've been using for 20 years, you know, be that mindful and learn with me? And I think so that's what we are working on. You know, we have an entire uh, artificial intelligence team within enterprise imaging and even overall change healthcare that, that are natively building these workflows to make, you know, our hanging protocols smarter. 
you know, even simple things like intelligent priors. And what do I mean by that? You know, if if a if a trauma patient walks in with a with a chest X-ray that you're trying to get a quick diagnosis. You know, your if if your systems are smart enough, and you know you have all of these, you know, NLP uh, learning algorithms built in, you should be able to pull, you know, not only the patient record but also some of the prior images to know that you know the patient always had a history of asthma. So you know, if you're seeing some scarring, is that what it is really about? And you know, pull up those images, pull up those reports, you know, whether they are an EMR or some other, you know, uh, system. And I think. Those kinds of intelligent, optimized workflows, I think that's where, you know, the radiologists and our organizations are going to see maximized productivity and output. You know, one of the best um, sort of examples I can share with you, you know, our workflow intelligence product, you know, it, it has these smart AI orchestrated workflows. And, you know, we saw at one of our hospitals, the, the, the ED wait times actually reduced by, you know, 17%. And the radiologist productivity went by 3%, you know, daily productivity. Now, what we're talking about is in, in a year, you know, you can actually have, you know, two, two fewer radiologists. That doesn't mean that, you know, you're actually, you know, letting anybody go, but, you know, you're reducing the burnout and, you know, people can actually, you know, work in the hours that, that, that are allotted, right? So I think that's where I feel AI can come in and make the biggest impact and sort of do these optimized, customized workflows where, you know, it really is sort of the technology itself is seamless and transparent uh, and and almost, you know, sort of um, uh, in a way that, you know, it completely uh, is, you know, uh, invisible, invisible to the to the user. And yet, you know, it's making making the, the out, output smarter and faster and cheaper. Okay. Maurice, so so many good things are being said about the cloud. Uh, it turns out, well, and there's even consensus on this on the chat, that we have to agree what cloud native applications, you know, what that term means. But I'm not going to have you define a term. You know, I'm, I'm going to ask you, how can facilities mitigate risk while still moving forward in establishing new systems, right? How does an informatics leader effectively identify risks and work with the different constituencies to achieve the right level of agency without getting into trouble? And if, if I can just add a little bit there is for a long time, the business model for radiology IT was lock you in and make it impossible for you to move. Are we going to do the same thing now? And uh, then I, I'm, I've spent all this time and then I'm in trouble again. I'm, I'm, yep. yeah. You know, it is probably uh, the conundrum. So let me uh, put on the other side of the coin because as a cloud vendor, we we buy a lot of this stuff. We have a lot of the same questions that a uh, big provider would have about where do we put the data? How are we gonna make it accessible? Can we, can we get it out? What happens if it goes down? So we've kind of uh, walked that road and live it at a granular level that is quite uh, difficult. And I think it all came back to us some years ago when someone explained, um, we need uh, 100% uptime. We can never be down. We have a stroke protocol that says, we can't tell the person who's having a stroke, if you could just wait a couple of minutes, this is gonna be fine. It's gotta be 100% uptime. Can you do that? Because otherwise it's not worth it to us to make a transition to another technology that'll have some other benefits. We know it'll be more accessible outside of our core hospital. There's all these other benefits, but at the end of the day, we can't ever be down. And so one of the things that I think you have to start thinking about is, how do you want to do clinical practice in the hospital? Mm. That's the where it all starts. And so your risk mitigation comes out of what is it that I am trying to accomplish clinically? I think front and center, we always walk behind with great respect and sort of humility saying, how do we support the clinical practice? What is it that is the priority? Because that's going to define risk. And if you don't start from that point of view, it becomes a conversation that is just ridiculous. I will only be down, you only lose X, Y, or Z percent. And it's not a way a clinician would think about it. You gotta start with what's the priority. And then you can translate that into a layer of what is the architectural demand that that will require. And you have to get somewhat subtle about it because it's not all services that can never be down. 
it's not all data that can never be down. So for example, I was having a conversation with a clinician who said, for my AI research, I'm not that interested in being able to have constant uptime and super fast retrieval. I'm okay if it comes over in a different way and I'd like to balance cost and availability, but for my stroke protocol, I can't have that conversation. And so you have to be able to start, as an informaticist inside a hospital, you need to have a different architectural diagram that says, how are we using data and how are we supporting clinical practice? And then I think you have a super valuable asset. You turn yourself into a CEO. She's going to be turning to you and saying, whoa, this is really, really helpful to me because it's helping me understand how data feeds our hospital. And it'll be incomplete, but you'd be shocked at how many service lines will be picked up by when is imaging critical and when is it not? When do I need to uh, uh, have near-term availability? When, do I, when, do I, when, when can it be slower? When am I willing to pay for that re really fast retrieval? When am I willing to pay for that really quick um, uh, uh, never being down? And that's just a different way to think about it. And if you're inside a hospital doing that, you'll blow people away in the management team because nobody else is thinking that way either. And at the end of the day, the CFO and the CEO have to start thinking that way. Uh, Bobby, so, you know, uh, we've had quite, quite some, um, so we've had the terms defined, we've understood the, the process. It turns out that cloud is not me putting my Google photos up there on you know, Google Drive and saying, I'm in the cloud. There's much more uh, stuff that we're doing there. We're starting to create an innovation platform, uh, thinking about what AI is doing for us. But we, we, we are the same people still working and being called, my iPad is down, you know, so, how, you know, facilities usually have these clinical IT requirements that need to be met. And every time you say IT, uh, I'll tell you my boss calls me when the phone is down and, and do all these IT things. And so how can, you know, what, what skills do the SIPs on the, on the line or people who want to get into this space need to get? And how does, you know, how do we balance this clinical IT? Uh, sorry, my dog is barking. But, uh, you know, how do we make uh, sense of what these hybrid setups look like and uh, how do we move the workforce to making sure that we have the necessary people who can lead these uh, types of initiatives at uh, every facility? Sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's a great one. So uh, certainly we all recognize that the clinical need has to come first. Uh, we have to make sure that we're taking care of the patients first and foremost and doing that at least as well, if not better than prior systems have always done. Um, so um, we've mentioned several times the, the exceptionally high um, resilience or robustness of the cloud infrastructure. Uh, it, this actually uh, kind of gets to a couple of the questions that I've seen posted in the Q&A section, as well of working with multiple cloud providers, or if a VNA is deployed in one cloud and the PAX is deployed in a different cloud, things like that. Um, so the cloud systems themselves are designed inherently to have multiple layers of redundancy, generally at least uh, double redundancy. So three instances of, of any storage device Usually that is distributed across multiple cloud provided data centers. Uh, often that's referred to as regions or zones or multiple zones within a region, that sort of thing. And it varies across the different providers. Something that a lot of people don't realize is that the different cloud providers all have exceptionally high performance interconnections between each other. So even if your PAX is deployed, for example, on the Google Cloud Platform and your archive is deployed on the Microsoft Azure Cloud Platform, that still means that they're exceptionally high speed connected with each other. Uh, of course, you're still dependent upon the performance of those applications in responding to questions uh, in the form of, say, a DICOM query and retrieve uh, back and forth with each other. Um, but the, the underlying infrastructure is already there and is already highly redundant or, or multiple instances uh, to protect against that. Um, one of the questions was actually talking about um, how do we prepare our workforce to be ready to handle this? And I would say as the on-premise infrastructure 
demands uh, continue to reduce as that's transitioned into uh, cloud environments, uh, the, uh, the ongoing need for people who are really good at supporting an application, uh, explaining it to new users that are always appearing at, at the facilities, uh, whether it be uh, a new group of residents that are coming through uh, or uh, a radiologist that's new to your facility uh, or uh, other clinical users, uh, technologists, uh, attendings, uh, physicians out on the floor, things like that. Having somebody that can effectively explain the functionality of an application. Um, uh, whether that is thought of as an applications specialist or a PACS administrator or a PACS uh, subject matter expert uh, varies across different uh, facilities, enterprises, vendors, uh, things like that. But it's, it's more and more emphasis on understanding the application rather than the underlying support infrastructure, since that's going to be provided in most cases by the cloud infrastructure or the vendor that is deploying in the cloud infrastructure. Thank you, Bobby. And please, if you're attending this and you have specific educational needs, please uh, put them in the chat. Uh, you know, we're in the process of organizing the annual SIM meeting and we want to make sure that we generate content that's relevant. And so, uh, Maurice, before I come back to Achi, you know, uh, has COVID-19 pushed interoperability forward? And um, in fact, I, even beyond that, when I think in my institution, home workstations, and teleradiology are probably the top things that are on people's minds, right? And uh, you know, there's a question that's related. How will, you know, what's going to be measurably different, if anything, in the way imaging uses cloud post-pandemic? So considering that you have these urgent things and um, you know, and and the opportunity or the misopportunity of the pandemic in terms of cloud. So was that for me or for Archie? Either of you. I said Maurice, but Archie yeah. can okay. also take it. <laughs> uh, well, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about the what happened in COVID is it helped solve for that conundrum of move fast and break things and do no harm. Because there were a lot of uh, very difficult choices that uh, were exposed that I think had always existed in healthcare. And one of the things that happened is the virtualization of access became uh, a real priority. And I don't think we're going back. I mean, it started out as an infection control, if you want to think of it that way, just the idea of telling somebody to come to a hospital to pick up a CD was insanity. You know, you were like, stay as far away from my facility as you possibly can and uh, we'll find a way to get this to you. And then it extended from there where all of a sudden you had heartbreaking stories about oncology patients who were being told, you know what, COVID is so dangerous right now, we're putting your oncology treatment on hold. We, you know, it, it was, when we think back to March and April, it literally felt like the world was going to end and there were people who were prognosticating things that were unthinkable. And as a result, all of a sudden, I think people understood how fragile the whole system was. As a consumer, if you were trying to take care of, as maybe I was taking care of somebody, how do you do that? All of a sudden, you were on your own and you really had to have access to your data. You had to be able to figure out a whole virtual path towards uh, success. And I think now that we've seen that and we can imagine it, I don't think we're going back. And, you know, Judy mentioned a little bit the political environment and how are we going to manage things. I think so much in healthcare is influenced by regulatory constraints and regulatory enablement. And I think we've seen a little bit of a crossing here. It could all be unwound, but there is now more regulatory freedom to do important things than there has been in the past. There's oper interoperability regulations and there's payment changes and there are some HIPAA changes that are really going to open up our ability to advance. So it was, it was a really scary time. I mean, I just remember the, the heartbreak, the, the ones that came home to me were people who were told your disease, we can no longer treat that because we're worried about this other disease. Even though your disease may very well kill you, uh, this disease is just too dangerous. And I was trying to square my mind around that. I'm like, to that person, their disease seems pretty darn dangerous. So at the end of the day, I think this virtualization and this independence and understanding how much of an advocate you had to be as a patient 
we call it consumerization, but at the end of the day, it's everybody has to be a partner in this. And that is what is enabling this technology change. It's a profoundly human um, thing born of a level of um, tragedy, which I think now happily, I hope we're kind of moving in a better direction, but at the time felt overwhelming. I don't know if that's helpful. It's a little non-techy. It's a little more emotional and maybe born of some personal experiences and feeling that energy around what happened then. But that's what I think is driving change. It's not that we have better bits and bytes. It's a really an emotional thing. Achi and Bobby, any different thoughts? Achi, you're muted. Thank you for reminding me. No, I think I, I am completely on board with what Morris said. You know, in fact, I'm going to share another sort of emotional story. You know, I have a, my best friend, you know, she's a practicing rheumatologist in, in New York City. And, you know, it was one of the worst waves hit. And so she was on the front line and center, you know, trying to actually take care of COVID patients. So even from the looking at it from the other side of the coin, you know, in terms of, you know, what our providers went through and then coming back to sort of her own practice and taking care of her own patients. One of the sort of aha moments, you know, something she said to me was, you know, before, I think, you know, she always felt that and, and I'm, I'm sure it's just one sort of uh, data point, but I, I, I'm I bet, you know, there are other, you know, providers who are thinking and feeling the same that before I think, you know, that that humanization of care and that personal personalization and, and, and you know, being in person, you know, providing that support, you know, was critical, especially for for her patients. But I think she's been able to uh, sort of affect change and, and really see how these collaboration tools have actually, you know, done some good, you know, especially for patients, you know, for her, you know, who couldn't even, you know, take a cab. And it was so much of a, so much of a hard thing to even sort of, you know, uh, negotiate transportation to sort of visit her. So I feel like, you know, even for providers, you know, they, they are sort of opening up more and more to this virtualization of care, as Morris mentioned. Obviously, I think the, the two other pieces that we've seen, you know, the adoption to cloud and also, you know, the, the precision medicine, I think, you know, both of those are also here to stay. What I think is also very much anticipated by, by PAX vendors and basically by all of HIT vendors is, you know, really upping up the collaboration game because virtual, virtual care is here to stay. And how do we offer stronger, more integrated, you know, communication support, you know, using with, you know, some of these latest, you know, cloud collaboration tools, I think that is going to be one of the key areas of innovation and acceleration in the next coming months and years. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll um, add to that if I could real quick, Joy, uh, yes. Judy, the, uh, the, um, uh, the innovation that has taken place, um, I, I think has been as much emotional as it has been technical over the last eight months or so. Uh, the, the underlying technical capabilities have been there for many years, and in some cases, 10 or 15 years or longer. Uh, back to the microservices uh, the comments from earlier. Um, but the, the whole um, uh, advent of the, the world in the coronavirus and COVID-19 um, and the response to that has certainly uh, put us in a situation as a society where we were forced to utilize those services, uh, even if they had been there before that. Uh, and, and now that we have used them and realized, hey, this is actually working and it's working pretty darn well. Um, uh, in fact, in many cases, it's working better than what we were already using and, and had accepted us as being the best it could be. Um, then I, I don't think it's going away at all. Um, I think the collaboration certainly is a significant enhancement. Uh, getting to a comment that someone asked in, in the chat uh, about uh, you know, sharing images and, and uh, report information, things along those lines, not just with physicians, but even out to patients. Uh, certainly if it's in a cloud infrastructure, that tends to be easier to enable than it is if it's in your on-premise environment um, because of all of the security infrastructure that's necessary to make that uh, a practical uh, thing to do. Um, it, it also gets into uh, the whole issue of, of performance. Uh, if you're on-premise and you're opening it up to your entire patient population, uh, do you have the physical infrastructure to support that as far as your network connectivity, the, the uh, hardware or virtual machine environments to support that kind of compute requirement? 
Whereas if it's deployed in the cloud uh, and based on microservices and the appropriate elasticity to expand and contract based on the load requirements, then that becomes relatively trivial. Uh, so all of that put together, I think cloud is here to stay for sure. Uh, and, and collaboration is a big part of that. Thank you, Bobby. And thank you so much for the people who are continuing to ask questions. Some are being answered live in, you know, in the session, others are being, the answers are being typed and we'll continue to do that because clearly we're not going to have all the time to answer the questions. But uh, I would like to ask about something that I'm pretty sure all of us on this call care about, ditch the disk, right? So many solutions to share imaging with others. What's the current state of this? You know, now let's move from maybe uh, more hypothetical to really understanding what's the current state of this using such a use case, how can we actually share imaging across institutions? And do I need to move all my enterprise to the cloud? So, you know, one of the things that I think is great about image exchange, which is really where we cut our teeth is that it eliminates uh, CDs. But I think where we've kind of not, where we need to do more work and more innovation is cross vendor interoperability. So if you are using any given system and we've made this pledge till the cows come home and we'll make it here again in this forum, we will interoperate with anybody regardless of um, uh, what technology stack they choose to have. Because we believe it should be as simple as sending a, image to us as it should be to any other vendor. And whether that institution makes whatever choice they make, it should be the same way you can use your ATM card in whatever bank you want to go to. And there, you know, at the market now in financial service again is so sophisticated that I don't think there are often any fees anymore. It's just you use your bank card where you want to use your bank card. And that is where we need to get to with ditching the disk. So it's possible to do and it is a question of political will. So there is uh, no technical limitation and there's only better technical uh, enablement on the horizon. So you have wonderful initiatives from ACR, from RSNA, various, uh, we participate in the RSNA um, uh, uh, connecting, you know, the, the architectural program they're putting forward. We love them all. But just today, we should make it so that at the most basic level, if you want to go from point A to point B and you want to go from vendor A to vendor B, that should be easy. And if we get there, then I think you're going to start really seeing the disks. I mean, my daughter put the disks, she, has a, she bought a bunch of CDs and she put them up on her, her room because she's like, these are such great light reflecting things. They're so cool. What do people really use them for? I was like... There you go. That's what people should use them for is light reflectors because that's all they're good for. And we really have a chance to, to get rid of them and turn them into architectural uh, enhancements to, uh, to people's rooms. And that's where, where it should go. You know, I couldn't agree with uh, Morris more. I, 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 um, I think it's really, it's really upon us, you know, in the industry. It's like he said, you know, it's the political will that I think, you know, we really do have to make that pledge to, to you know, really put, put our patients and our providers front and center to make that kind of, it's like he said, you know, the technology is all there. Uh, now it's just about us working together to getting it. Getting it. Bobby, this is an important topic because all of us feel the pain. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an exceptionally important topic. And, and uh, I certainly agree with everything that Morris and Archie have already said. Uh, I, I think uh, certainly from, uh, from the perspective of making sure that each facility has all of the capabilities that they need, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of simplify it and say uh, a cloud bridges that gap and connects all those facilities with all of the different uh, needs, uh, uh, people who need to have access to that data. Um, and whether that be um, radiologists or patients or researchers, uh, it, it's, it simplifies that process of connecting everyone together in a, a, a more performant and redundant and reliable environment. Okay. So new terms here we hear, we, the cloud themselves, they need to be interoperable. So are we migrating our old systems to new to attempt to a new solution? And what are the disadvantages? When is cloud not the answer? 
Well, just as a quick, um, a quick thing that I think we should just make sure we're not saying is this is not one of those things where um, unless you buy every single component, your stereo, you know, your, your, your sound system's not going to work. It's not like that. It is possible to have a very uh, mishmash of stuff. You're not going to move everything to the cloud. You're going to have some stuff on-prem. It's going to be the, in the world of an API first architecture. So you have application, you know, these interfaces, you can, you can manage this. So there's going to be times where for cost or for convenience, whatever it is, you're going to have a lot of different uh, things at play. And I also want to bring it back to the interoperability discussion. Don't let anybody tell you that until everybody's in the cloud, we can't possibly share data because that would be a tragedy because that, that is not the table stakes for that happening. We need to do that right now. Um, so I think that when we, so that's, that's, I think, I think everyone would agree with me. We need to make sure that's not the takeaway from this. Cause that isn't the harder question is how do you do the decision-making around when do you go, uh, quote unquote cloud and when do you, uh, uh, stay, go hybrid. Yeah. Go hybrid. how do you balance all those different considerations? And I think that is the, the evolving and complex discussion. The only thing I would say about cloud is if you're ever curious about whether you think you are comfortable with the cloud, test it because it's eminently testable and test it under all sorts of very clear uh, defined criteria. And someone can give you, we could talk about it. You wanna make sure you understand what your bandwidth is. You wanna make sure what the loads are during the day. You wanna make sure that this system doesn't work perfectly on bandwidth you don't actually have in loads that are not accurately representing yours. That's not helpful. So what's nice about cloud is you can actually test it before you buy in a way that it, you know on-site is a little harder. But regardless, I think at the end of the day, it's going to come back to understanding what your performance requirements are. And if you can get them, and you often can. I mean, you know, Bobby and Archie, they're, they're experts at this and they understand the physics of it in a really deep way. And they'll give you very good analysis of what's happening. And that's really, really important. And you get to decide. And if it's just simply not fast enough for the near term use you have because your institution has bandwidth that's being clogged by other things, it's a moot point whether cloud is better. It's just not going to work. And so, you know, and if you don't think you can get your CTO or CIO to expand bandwidth, then it's a pointless this conversation, but you get to test. And that's, I think, what both Archie and Bobby are saying about this is that there's a way to evaluate before you buy that might not have been present when you had to build your own data center and then kind of hope it all worked. Yeah, and you know, I want to add a little bit of color to uh, what Morris said. I think, you know, even you know, sort of uh, test before you buy, right? I think you know we can even take that a little bit further. I think my you know advice to any of the CIOs I talk to is, you know, what are your organizational goals? I think you know Morris touched upon it. You know, what, what is the performance that you're looking for? What kind of investment, you know, budgets you have? You know, whether it's capex, opex, and you know what kind of uh, sort of you know. Um, uh, adaptability there is and then you know to change management because you know it is it is definitely I think moving if, if you know if we tell you here that you know moving your on-prem to cloud is just going to be magic right away I you know I we would all be sort of you know not telling you the truth um, there is there is definitely a lot of planning and a lot of you know change management involved you know you are taking your sort of very high high energy resources and you're you are you're looking at you know sort of reallocating repurposing them i think i would start with your what are your organization's goals you know if, if they are really about you know reducing length of stay improving your turnaround times you know go go you know to more back to morris's point you know go test out you know all of these solutions that are out there while you're testing it i think you know uh, talk to your vendor, you know, of choice and say, you know, show me the ROI calculation. Because I think one of the big things is, you know, the promise of the cloud and the promise of the technology has to be around, you know, uh, around the levers of, you know, cost and care. And so, you know, the biggest promise is that, you know, your cost will reduce, you know, over length of time with subscription and, you know, let them, you know, run the ROI models with based on, you know, your organizations, you know, sort of your bandwidth, you know, your, your storage needs, your compute needs. And I think that is the place where I would encourage, you know, all of you to start, you know, as you, as you embark on this, you know, 
cloud or fully cloud or hybrid cloud journey. And in most cases, it is going to be a hybrid cloud journey, as Morris mentioned, and that I something that I mentioned earlier too, that you know you 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 pick and choose of what components you you know you've made recent investments, and you know you're going to get the most out of it, and then start building one thing at a time into cloud. Um, so that would be sort of you know my two cents there. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Lots of questions on the chat. We will have an Ask Industry session uh, next uh, during the uh, 2021 uh, annual meeting. And so please join us for, you know, just first of all, thank you so much, uh, Archie, Bobby, and Maurice for your great insights. And, um, you know, join us for the next Ask Industry uh, webinar, which is going to be how can AI get more out of medical images. And so this will be moderated by the fantastic Dr. Tessa Cook on January 7, 2021. And so uh, thank you for joining us today for uh, the Ask Industry webinar. This webinar will be archived and made publicly available on the same website within the next seven to 10 days. Please remember to complete the post survey website that will pop up after the webinar has ended if you're a SIM member and would like to receive uh, SIM IIPCE. And thank you, uh, panelists, for an engaging discussion. Uh, lots of questions, by the way, to left to answer. We may have to bring this again. And thank you, the audience, for uh, just an enthusiastic uh, participation. This is probably the largest SIM uh, webinar. And happy holidays to all. Please be safe out there. Well, thank you, Judy, for giving this in, uh, this, facilitating this exciting session. And I obviously, I, I get to learn a lot from my peers. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity and happy holidays, everybody. Have a fruitful 2021. Yeah, this was fantastic, Judy. Amazing moderation. And um, I'm so energized. I, I'm like, I, I can't even stop now. So I'm going to have to go figure <laughs> out some people to talk to, which is very difficult in COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and don't hesitate to reach out for further conversation with all of us. I'm sure yeah. we're, we're all right. very much open for that. Uh, and we would love to continue the conversation. It's been great. Thank you. Thank awesome. you, Judy, for hosting. Awesome.